Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in beautiful and very dark Canterbury, New Hampshire. I wanted today, tonight, to do a special extension of this project. This is a simple tapered leg project, but in the past I've done a number of pieces that have been like an upscale or designer version of this table. And in fact, in the 18th century, the early federal period, this style leg, this simple tapered leg, was embellished in so many ways that made it just um, extravagant in many cases where you would have many inlays and probably most popular, the bellflower uh, that was shaded in, in hot sand. And, and you had all these beautiful lines down in arcing little inlay lines. And then you have, quite often you'd have a cuffed foot with a kind of contrasting veneer down there. So lots of ways to go to spruce this up a bit, but I wanted to share with you a method that I used on a few other pieces. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Yay! We're going to start out by showing you a piece that I made a few years ago. This is a, an interpretation of a classic federal sideboard where um, I changed some of the lines and things of it, but um, I didn't use any of that wild embellishment on the, on the legs. Like this is kind of from that period where you might have had that but I wanted to use veneer in a way that was decorative or almost like paint and not have a lot of splashy contrast, but rather use the same color tone, the same veneer largely on the entire face, but just by arranging it in interesting patterns to create a beautiful composition. So you have kind of this, uh, it's got a soft bow front, this, this um, sideboard it stands about 38 inches tall and I can't remember how long I know it's over five feet and then this nice arced section which is a kind of a beautiful visual center point but the the big thing I did here was put this radiant sunburst with this ribbon figured Cuban mahogany I used that ribbon figure to make a sunburst on the two doors and the center door then it's all vertical here now, this is some outstanding Cuban mahogany veneer I had. And the legs, the material, I used mahogany for all these, these six legs, but it was not, it was really nice mahogany, but it didn't look exactly like the Cuban mahogany. And I wanted to have kind of like this seamless con continuity across the front where you had that ribbon figure going down the leg and then just flowing right into this bow front apron here that has the nice arc in it. So in order to achieve that, the legs also had to be veneered. So I controlled the entire piece, the color, the figure, everything was controlled because it was all veneered. The entire piece, even the sides, are veneered with this Cuban mahogany veneer in an interesting pattern. So the legs were solid and the doors and drawer fronts and this panel here are laminated into this curve over form. These doors are bordered by a little hard gaboon ebony line, so is the drawer. And then all the bottom edges here, you can't almost see it here because it's lost in the relief of the dark background, but there is an ebony line all along the bottom edge here too. And also these ebony cuffs around the feet. So you have the veneered legs and an ebony cuff. Now, sometimes these ebony feet could actually be solid. I've seen some people actually uh, make them solid. I'm trying to think if I've made them solid. The only times I think I've made them solid is when they, I've turned them. Um, Usually I'm veneering, and when I'm using a taper veneer, I will veneer the foot as well. So I want to show you tonight the technique I used to veneer this leg to create this almost a designer leg out of the very same tapered leg that we had there. So let's set this aside. Here's what we're doing. We've got these 
four cherry legs that are very uh, really the same as what we worked on for that table they're just like an inch and three-eighths square they're 20 just about 27 inches long and they taper down to a little heavy five-eighths so these are the legs the style leg that i want to work on and that's all you need a four legs like this and then of course you would veneer the aprons of the table as well but we're just focusing on legs today so Tom, were the legs veneered separately or was the front case veneered after assembly ah David's great question. question um the case is actually that would be quite difficult to veneer it while it's assembled unless you possibly use some of the techniques i'm about to use but i had to veneer over those curved elements that run between the legs so all of the part all of the face was the joinery was done and it was built without veneer on it it was assembled dry fit like those sections and then i would veneer it clean the edges and then it all got glued up like it was solid so everything like glue uh, grew the uh dimension of the veneer so that's how it got so seamless and uh was controlled that way so the curved parts are all veneered in the bag or in the vacuum press bag on the form again so uh, but i want to show you tonight a method that i've used in a number of cases where i was in a kind of sticky situation it was a situation where i couldn't clamp it conventionally and didn't want to put it in the vacuum bag so an, a method that you can use in certain situations that i want to show you first tonight is ironing on veneer making your own designer iron on veneer so that's what we're going to do now just for starters this is that a piece of that cuban mahogany so those legs and all that front that stripey kind of figure down here is what i would have called off to veneer the all those legs in that way so that's just one little piece i was going to use this but i thought it'd be more fun to switch it up a little bit and we're going to use zebra wood like this so it doesn't matter that's the beauty your options are wide open when it comes time to uh, veneer a table base so we've got these very plain cherry legs um, and we're going to veneer them and you can you're going to end up having like a designer looking table now sometimes i know veneer gets kind of a bad name it's almost like oh you're fake in it oh you're fake in nice wood right mm -hmm. and it got kind of a bad name in the early 1900s when manufacturing methods started to veneer heavily over pieces probably the most common thing we've seen in our lifetimes is a singer sewing machine cabinet which more than likely has the veneer popping or failing somehow because they rushed it they actually didn't um, veneer or glue it down to a uh a substrate in the proper way they glued it down in ways that where the substrate was solid and it was glued up at cross angles so in the passage of time that core is expanding and swelling and shrinking and the veneer would just pop and, and it would telegraph the boards below that's how you know you didn't get really a good uh, base for this we're going to do it we're we're just veneering over the wood in the same grain direction so there's no like loss of integrity in the material or anything and the veneer is going to be on there for good i just got some veneer here and you've got to prepare it to be iron on now you might be familiar with iron on veneer this is a piece of edge banding which is used in the furniture industry um, to cover the edges of plywood basically so what you have is an actual piece of veneer but it's got the glue already on the inside and see it's all pearly and beaded up it's pretty thick but it's heat sensitive like all glues are like uh, especially these glues that I'm going to show you in a second so when that gets heated and pressed on a lot of times they'll go through different types of edge banders to quickly put a solid veneer edge on a piece of plywood and then you know sometimes they were used as cabinet doors very often and so you don't see that edge and it gives the appearance of solid wood 
with the veneer on the panel. But that's one way you can get your, your iron-on veneer all ready to rock. But it comes in edge band form. You can get it in different materials. I almost never use this stuff. You see how old this is. Anyway, we're going to make our own. And that's really what you want because you want to use any veneer that you can. So you can buy any veneer you want from places like Certainly Wood. And they'll, you can go on their website, Certainly Wood Veneer, and just search through all of their veneers and just It's get actually certainlywood.com and we have the link below for you. Yeah, but if you want to put solid feet on, like I mentioned earlier, like the Gaboon or something, or some other uh, exotic, then you can connect with someone like Goose Bay. They have small billets and they'll happily send them off. But for veneer, you got a whole lot to choose from at a place like Certainly Wood. So here we're gonna use this zebra wood and we're gonna get started. So to make our iron on veneer, we're gonna put on our glue and we want a glue with a fairly low um, heat point or melt point. So this PVA glue, the white glue melts at the lowest temp and then you get to the yellow glue, it's a little higher and then like say like Type Bond 3, a waterproof glue like, like that is even higher. But it will, they will react, it just takes more heat. So you wanna use the one that's most favorable and this is plenty strong. So white glue is plenty strong to hold veneer, especially in this case that we're doing. I have a couple questions about the, um, I don't know if I'm using the right word when I say the substrate that you would use for the legs, what kinds of woods you would recommend. Dean's curious, could you use MDF? Um, because you're using oh, exotic veneers, oh, yeah. would you choose what kind of woods That's for the That's a good legs? question. Um, just to back up to what I was just saying about, you don't want to think of a veneer as hiding some inferior core. So the worst thing is when someone looks at a piece of furniture and, and sees something nice and then makes the discovery that it's, it's really cheap or it's not what it appeared to be. So I like using solid wood core. I would like actually to use a darker wood like cherry or poplar. I wouldn't use MDF, I mean, not for legs. They're not as structurally strong. They, MDF is not super strong. It's just all glued up powder, basically. So that would be, that would be a cheapen out for the legs. However, MDF as a panel for a top is fine because it's stable, it's not stressed in that way, and it's quite effective as a table surface top to veneer over. But I, not really for legs. Um, so I would use regular wood, make, cut your legs out in the grain direction so you get all the strength and characteristics of a true leg. And then we're gonna veneer over. I just wanted to show you that white glue that we're gonna use. So here's our roller. We've got, this makes it a lot easier to coat the veneer. That bag just keeps it fresh longer. So I was using it a little earlier. And anyway, I just gonna ro I'm just gonna roll it on here. Did I say I just gonna? And look, you're putting a kind of a gracious amount. You're as if you're painting it. And uh, what happens is, as it dries, it gets translucent again, and you can just feel that the veneer has become almost leathery. Are there veneer, uh, excuse me, grades, quality grades for veneer, Tom? Um, quality in terms of figure, like when you go to buy it, it's all wood, so you'll actually see the grain, like a really wide grain um, pattern. Um, it's just like solid wood. It indicates that the tree probably grew fast. If you see the growth rings really spread apart, you know, on especially a quarter sawn piece. Um, but it's, it's just wood, so it's still wood. It's, it's as if you're buying regular wood. It's usually characterized by the amount of figure on it when they talk about grading it. It's, you'll have your, your best grades, maybe like instrument grade. You know, you have terrific figure for fiddleback maple or something like that. Um, but here where, You'll be able to go on there and see there's some 
grades, probably the one of the lower grades, is called backer veneer. And it's not meant to be seen. It's actually meant to be underneath. And it, it's like a first coat of veneer that you might put on a piece of material to stabilize it. So you can cross band your veneer almost like plywood. And that backer veneer uh, could be in core, but it also backer veneer is used often on the underneath of a table or something where it's not going to be seen. It's in darkness or the inside of a panel of a chest. So it's not greatest grade, but it's really cheap. And it's, but it's still wood. It's, I mean, it's not great in appearance, but it's good in a, uh, quality. But you can look at it all and you'll see you get, it's priced accordingly to grade. So if you'll, when you go on the site, it'll make sense to you. So what you're going to do is then you'll let this dry and then it'll, it'll look almost like nothing's on there. I know it's hard to believe, right? And then you're going to roll it again and then it's going to dry off again. So you do the exact same thing. So you get two good layers in case you have any light weak spots and just having that amount when you iron it on, it's going to get into the other material as well. So here's a piece that I've already done two coats on. Okay. So here's a piece of zebra wood and this surface, you can't even hardly tell, right? But you can see it's kind of glossy, little sheen, soft satin sheen to it. Mm. But that's all the glue and it feels a little heavier and kind of a little more rubbery. So we're going to use this. We're going to cut up off a piece. So let's just use our leg as our guide here. And I want to leave some extra so I can cut that off after. And let me plug in the iron while I'm cutting this so it can be heating up. I'm going to set the iron on high. Tom Allen says he was told to um, put veneer on both sides of the core if core is solid, cheap timber to prevent warping. Is that true? He's yeah, it is true. Um, Alan, that's um, because you don't want to destabilize the panel if you veneer just one side you've kind of changed the equation of stresses on that side so now you're kind of um, holding back the grain with a layer of wood that's been glued to that side so if you had a large panel top you'd want to do that um, in some cases it's not a problem you could do one side and not worry about it um, but on a panel like that it will tend to lose its shape I'm just trying to rough saw this right now. It's, it's more durable when it's got the glue on it. Danny's saying the veneer buckles with glue on it if not pressed. Does that cause any issues? Is that your experience? Well, you'll see. We, we, uh, we're going to iron it on right now, and I'm going to show you. It does. It is a little puckery right now. I mean, not much, but not any more than it was when... When I started, this, this zebra wood has a little bit of roll to it, so it's pretty much the same. But when you iron it down, you're putting pressure and heat. So, let's see. Here we go. We're going to go this way like this. Okay. So we'll set that down on there. Now, let's remember our cuff foot. I decided by eyeballing it uh, that it should be about three and a half inches up is the cuff. So when I iron this on, I want to stop at about that point. So I'm going to set this to three and three eighths. So I don't want to come all the way up to the three and a half. So if I make a line across there, my cuff is going to end up coming up beyond that. So what I want to do is actually glue this down to come beyond where the cuff is and then I'm going to cut it and clean off the edge and then the, the cuff piece will be glued in after the sides have been on. Okay, so let's just get this in position here and I'm going to make a little line there. You didn't, did you coat both sides with glue, Tom? Just this side. Just the one side. Yeah. Okay. I could do the leg as well. You can do that. And quite often, I have done both sides, and you have more glue to come together. But it actually works on this. If you get enough weight glue on there, it will work with a single side. But if you really want to be 
cautious, you can do both. I'm just going to cut through this with a chisel. It doesn't have to be perfect. And set that right there. So I'm going to be a little beyond. I'm going to put some tape on here to hold it in position while I'm ironing on. And then I'll remove the tape as I seal it on there. It's almost like if you ever use the old contact cement and you would put the sticks under it and you'd make sure that nothing touched that contact cement until you had it positioned and you were ready to pull those sticks off. Well, this is similar. It's that we're going to be ready. We're going to make sure it's in position and actually start gluing at this end and we'll be pulling tape off instead of sticks out. Funny you mentioned contact cement because I had a question from Carlton asking if you've ever used that on veneer. I have. Um, a lot of people frown on it. <laughs> I have, early on, there was a guy who had a book and he talked about using it, and I've used it. It's just really messy and toxic and nasty stuff, so if, um, it's not ideal. I, then I, I read other articles that, you know, where people, this was years ago, people said, never use contact cement, <laughs> but I know it works, so, but it's overkill for veneer. You really can use a thinner Thing. Save your contact cement for Formica. All right, so this is good and hot. Let's give it a shot. We're going to start up here, so we'll tack it down right here. So it's going to be like liquefying or plasticizing the glue, and I'm just going to bear down to the edges. And I like getting my roller out, and I don't want to go over the end. While it's hot, can I just throw some questions at you while you're doing that? Uh, sure. How about hide glue for veneering? Oh yeah, hide glue works great. We did that once. Um, we did that once. We did a curved drawer front. I forgot to link to that one, but yeah, hide glue is great. However, it's um, it's tricky because it's as it cools, it it grabs. So you need to have everything warm. You have to be. It's hard to use in the winter. It would, it would be near impossible for me, like in the winter here, because I keep it fairly cool in the shop, in the low, low 50s. And, uh, but then I, I have a little space heater that I kick on. That, and then we have all this radiant sunlight come in. But when I come in the morning, it's, it's like 52. I have <laughs> but, a couple <laughs> questions about how much wider than the substrate you made the veneer. I made it about a sixteenth to an eighth wider on each, well, I've got a good, you know, give yourself close to an eighth overhang on each side so you don't get caught. Like sometimes if it gets off track and it starts tracking wrong and it runs off, you kind of, kind of stuck, literally, with it in the wrong place. So Tom, Chris is asking, if your legs are pillowed, oh. uh, how would you go about applying veneer and how would you deal with the rounded corners? Oh man, I had to ask that. <laughs> I, I don't usually put veneer on pillowed legs. In fact, I don't think I ever have. Um, I, um, but I think I would, you're exactly right. Those questions are exactly on point because you, you would have trouble. The rounded part is easy because you could vacuum press that and you could use that in the vacuum bag without any kind of call. And the actual bag itself would come down and hit the leg. But where you have issues are on the corners, they're not as crisp, and it would be harder to define those. So that's why it's, you don't, it would be harder to do on that. I would say go with solid zebra wood. <laughs> <laughs> And you're all set. You can buy this solid, actually, too. Um, I've seen it at different places, um, but it's pricey. I think it was close to $15 a foot. Does anybody know? So anybody? Tom Will's curious, if you need to use veneer conditioner to smooth out gnarly veneer, is that done before glue is put on? Yes. That is a treatment that you do kind of the day before. You would uh, apply that as directed, and it's just a sequence where you put it on and um, 
think that's good. All right, I'm gonna shut this off now. And uh, you wet the veneer. I can't go into the whole thing, but anyway, you, you have some paper that you gotta stack it flat under some, between some boards so it it's, doesn't really dry. When you first wet it, you gotta hang it up almost like on clothespins until it gets all the, the heavy moisture comes out. Then you put it between layers of paper and in a press. I usually put it in a vacuum press. Now sometimes I have actually uh, put a piece of paper on there between the iron so I wouldn't scorch the veneer, but I was moving fast enough where I didn't really blacken it. And usually you're just lightly discoloring it that comes off in sanding. But here I'm gonna, now, this is the beauty of the iron-on. It's already on, so you can now cut it off. Now I could run this on a router, um, with a flush cut bearing, but I just usually stay at the bench and trim it off quickly, if it's a straight edge especially, with the veneer saw. You get a really nice clean cut, and then at the top you can do the same. And then down the long side. Notice that side? I already, uh, I already ironed on that earlier to make sure it would work so I wouldn't totally embarrass myself. Oh, let's not cut a finger here. Oh, I know what I was doing. I was hitting the offset there. All right, so check it out. Wow, that's We've got cool. now two corners and this is just purely ironed on and there is not, there's not a bubble on there. Usually if you tap it, you'll hear a bubble. It'll sound like a little tch -tch -tch. and it's really annoying when it happens, but the good thing is you can just go back with the iron and press that spot because you may not have gotten enough heat in that spot. If you don't have enough glue in that spot, you're going to have to pry under there, like make a knife cut in and get some glue under there. Otherwise, you're going to be in, it's going to be a bubble and it makes difficulties down the road. All right, so this is started, doesn't have the cuff, but that's the iron on method. Now, if you don't want to use the iron on method, I get it. It's, I always am questioning like, is the bond as good? It can't be. I, you know, I don't think it's as good because you don't get the, the full moisture into both sides. And, um, you know, ideally you would apply it to both pieces, but I'm telling you that is, <laughs> that is on there. So nicely done in a, in a case where you have an unusual side, it's harder to clamp. It's a good way to go. But I want to show you the, the regular um, glue application. Let's just use the regular veneer. Here, you don't have to do any pre-sizing and weighting and all that. That's kind of the time-consuming aspect of that piece. Now, this time we're going to veneer over the surface that has the flat. See, this is tapered on the inside, and you can see where I drew the mortise. So this is going to be angled right here. It's flat and then it starts into the angle of the taper. So we're gonna get the veneer on that, sh that little more challenging side so you can see how I go about that. So you apply the, the veneer before cutting the mortise usually? Um, I've done it both ways actually. If your rails are coming in flush, like on that sideboard, you have to cut your mortises first because you're you need to apply the, the veneer and everything has to be flush. So you gotta cut your mortises and make sure all the surfaces, intersecting sur surfaces are flush. And then you can put your veneer on. They can just use a little uh, a router bit with a flush bearing and you can go right around the mortises and clean them out very quickly and square off the corners. It works very quickly. Is, is uh, splintering ever an issue when you're sawing there, the thin strips? But not only here, but when you were doing it on the thinner strips before? Is splintering ever an issue? Oh yeah, it is. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons I use a saw. If you use a knife with a fibrous material like the zebra wood, it will want to track in the grain and go off your straight edge. So a, a saw is not as susceptible to that because it's sawing the wood. It's not a knife like sticking into the grain of the wood. We put a link to a veneer saw in the description. One option of one. Yeah, I don't know if it's the exact same, but 
This one, I think I got like a two cherries or something like that. And then I put my own handle on it. I actually did a video of making these handles. If anybody's yeah. really jealous of my handles. <laughs> uh, Bob says Hard Highland Hardwood has, I believe he's talking about the zebra wood, 1790 per board foot. Oh boy. Yeah, so see, if you can get it in the veneer, you're going to spend quite a le bit less money. I mean, no, <laughs> not board for board, like board foot for board foot, but um, you can cover a lot more material, and you'll get exceptional grade. You'll be able to pick exactly what you want. Okay, so I'm just going to cut this a little long up here. All right, so there I'm, I'm aligned, but remember our cuff foot. We've got to have that marked again. So I'm going to come over with my three and three eighths. Okay, my cuff is going to be up here. So I'm going to glue this all the way down there. So I'm going to put a piece of tape on here to keep the glue from going any further down. Other, otherwise, I'll have a lot to clean off in order to true that surface up to put my cuff foot veneer on there. So that's a little blocker. And let me mark this. So this is my face. And now I'm just gonna get the glue on there. I would set up like a small roller and you could roll if you're doing a number of legs, but I'm gonna use this glue roller and just put it on manually here. But the thing about this is you need calls to glue it down, but you also need um, it, you feel better about the quality of the bond, I think. So it's nice if you can glue it down. But um, I still, I, I have a lot of confidence in the, in the iron-on. I'm just saying if I had a choice and it wasn't that much of a difference. So what's nice is if you have four legs to do, you can use a glue that sets pretty quickly. So by the time you get to your fourth leg and you get that glued up and clamped, you can go back to the first leg and it's already set. So you can take the clamp off and go ahead and do your next side. So that's why I'm using a glue like this. This is a kind of a flat, fast bonding. It's Gorilla Glue, but if you use regular yellow tight bond, that would be the same. It gives you a short open time and that's what this talks about, short clamp time. So you don't want too much glue, but the thing you got to really be sure of is that you get it out to the edges. Now, if you're using a porous veneer like I am here, this, this zebra wood is an open grain wood. I think I got enough on there. That's just right, actually. So with an open grain wood, you have to uh, be careful. The glue, if you put so much glue, it's going to squeeze through the pores and want to glue your call to it. So, again, I'm going to put some tape on here. This tape I'm going to leave on here so that the veneer does not slide around at all when I put the pressure on it. There we go. And I've got some cherry here. Now, you, in order for an open gray wood, it will come through. That glue will come through and want to stick to whatever the call is. So I put some wax on here. Yeah, it's this face. I just paste waxed it and then it won't stick. But um, up here, I've got that little change in direction. So I've got a smaller block that I'm gonna use to get that first bit. And let's just get some clamps here. I'll just throw this right on here. I'll get that first three inch or so. And then set this right up to the front there. Now, if you forget and leave that piece of tape in there, it won't be a problem because that was my little guide tape because the tape, it won't stick, but I'm going to pull it out because I remembered, <laughs> but I have not in the past. It's not a big deal. All right, let's get some of these clamps. You just need, just need about four or five of these clamps. I'll put one up here. And if I put this clamp on the other side, it'll start to support itself. 
I won't go struggling with this situation here. Now, if you didn't have tape on there, you'd have to worry that the veneer might be slipping, but I'm not really worried about it, but we'll take a look. And if it did slip, I'm just gonna say it's perfect. Because <laughs> I never make mistakes. It's always perfect. Yeah, right. All right, so that looks great. It's, it is overhanging all around. Beautiful. All right, so you can set this aside and then you'd work on another leg and you'd be cycling through. So if you think about that, you know, it would take you probably a couple hours or so if you had all your pieces cut to get through four legs. But you would have exotic designer legs. So then we want to uh, get next into cuffing the feet. So I've got one here. Once you've got that side, you would trim the edge like we did in a second ago. And then you'd glue on the next surface. One thing I, I meant to mention is you got to make sure you get that glue on the edge. I don't know if you saw me that at the end I tried to make sure going down the edges. Here's one that I've already um, done all four sides except that last side was just glued on. So we're going to get it to see how it looks completely. Here's my little guide pieces of tape. We'll get those off. And then we're going to just go ahead and trim it. The thing you have great control of is the grain of this. So I laid out the grain so it was flowing in a nice di direction as well. Now let's trim this quickly. I'm using the, the leg as my straight edge. So I'm keeping that veneer saw flat against it. And light passes at first. And then it just comes off beautifully right on the edge. Same here. Um, Steve's curious about that short piece that you had at the end because of a change of grain direction. Can you explain what that was about? When you put the call on, you had two different calls. Oh, you know yeah, Steve. Um, these legs are tapered. Okay, so one surface the outside corners are true, the inside surfaces are tapered. So it's only tapered on two sides. So these start out flat and then the taper runs down. So if I put a flat call on here, I wouldn't have been putting pressure at that top. See how that... So I put a small piece on the top and then I put another piece below. So if you have an uneven surface like that, you know, you have to get creative if you're clamping it on. However, you notice that on the iron-on, you, you can go right over that and not even worry. So that's one advantage of I'm the ironing. I'm curious to see the way you did all the edges of all of the different sides. Uh, yeah, I'll show you that in a second. How close you got or able to do that. Oh, it's perfect. Of course, that, that's <laughs> the assumption. They just want to see it. All right, here you go. Look no, at that corner. It's sharp right now, but after you break the edges, it looks so, it's imperceptible that it's not solid. So you softly break the edges. You have more than you think there to break too. But if I had joinery here and I was flush fitting, I'd make sure I didn't break that edge. So when I joined it up, it would be flush across and it would look great. That's what I had to do on that sideboard I showed you at the beginning. So yeah, all those edges are nice and tight because you have to make sure you have that glue all the way at the side. But look, we've got this fractured, messy looking foot and... Did it matter, Tom, each, which sides you glued up? And was there any order to that as you glued them down? Was there any specific... Uh, there is, there, if you want to be a real purist about it, yeah. Uh, technically, once you sand these edges, you can't really tell which layer overlaps the other layer, but... What I usually do, and this is, is you'll do the inside layers first and then the outside layers after. And technically, to be a real purist about it, if you weren't going to have any edging there, you do the inside surfaces and then if this was the face where you were looking at this piece, I'd do this side and then lastly I would veneer the face. 
So that piece of veneer on the face is spanning the entire width. So it's the last piece on. So it's glued over everything else. And then you break the edges. So technically, if you looked hard, you, you might think you could see the edge of the veneer. But I'm telling you, when you break the edge, you cannot see that edge of veneer. But it's a 42nd of an inch thick. So technically, you could. But <laughs> it's, it's really small. So, but that is the pure order. And I usually do exercise that. I know I did that on that piece because I had to do it for those joints to come together correctly. I didn't want a piece of veneer on the side to be between the joints of the face of the leg and this rail coming in. I didn't want a piece of veneer coming out in the middle. So this surface on the leg was veneered last. Hope that makes sense. Okay, now um, here's, let me just, I didn't mark, okay, that's one. That's fine. Okay, so here I just want you to see that's where the mortise is. That's the mortise. So this is my taper here below the mortise. So my tapering corners. So out here is my good corner. I put this is my face and my face. So this is kind of the square corner all the way down. So I'm going to work off of that square corner to mark this. I'm going to come up. Tom, when you talk about breaking the corners, do you use a block plane or is that just sanding or what are you doing there? Um, I'll demo that really quick. I would just take some 220 like this and sand, but with veneer, do not sand straight. You want to kind of sand at a diagonal like this at first. So you're, you're making sure you don't catch on any fibers. Then then you can go the long way, okay? So give it that first, lightly. I'm using 220. And then you go through your normal sanding. So, I mean, look at it. Then does that look solid or what? Okay, yeah, so great. let me um, let me get this going here. I'm going to come up three and a half, like we said. I caught my uh, something on that, and I think I... Right about three and a half, it wanted to break. All right, so now I'm going to take my little square and I'm going to work from this outside corner, which is true, okay? Not the tapered surfaces. So I'll put my knife on the three and a half. Now I'm going to use the scalpel in this, this uh, situation here at first to just cut through that layer of veneer. Wait, is that three and a half? No, that's three. Well, it didn't look like three and a half. I marked it at three. Good, because I, I could feel that corner was loose. All right, there. That's better. So we're going to just put our scalpel on three and a half. Bring the square up. Here we go. You know how you sometimes have to put a square and square a line around a square a leg, and you're hoping that it ends up in the same spot on the when you get to the other side? And, uh, well, that's what we're going to do now, but we're doing it with a knife line, so there's no, there's no forgiveness here. We can't erase it, so I better get it right. So I'm just finishing with a little sawing into that to make sure I get through that piece of veneer. Now I'm going to work from that outside corner. I'm going to flip the square and put my knife right in that knife line, okay? And... Bring the square up to it, and now I'm going to just score right across. All right, so those are my two outer faces. I should be glued a little, like an eighth of an inch beyond that, if everything worked out the way I held that thing, or I marked it off. Now I'm going to just come in this way. Again, I'm going to put the knife right in that knife line and bring up the square and go ahead and knife across. You know, if you do end up missing it somewhat, you, it's going to be slightly off on the inside, but you can true it up anyway. It's not a problem if it wasn't perfect. Okay, now this one I'm going to come from this direction. This is the last one. I'm going to put my 
scalpel in the knife line again, bring up the square, and score cross. And hope it hits the other knife line. If you hurried and didn't hit it, it's kind of... But it looks pretty good. Drum roll, David says. Yeah, we're good. We're, we're connecting nicely all around. Beautiful. All right, so now I'm just going to glue up. Let's get the, the cuff veneer. We've got a little piece of, uh, of this ebony here. I need a, hmm, I'll just use this leg for a straight edge because I don't have anything. So I'm going to cut the veneer. Seven eighths is all I need to get the width. So I'm just going to get a strip of this ebony. Now this is actually Macassar ebony, but it's so dark. There aren't, Macassar has more lighter stripes in it, but uh, the Gaboon is what is the true pure black ebony. But this, you can often find it on the veneer sites. If you get some that doesn't have much white in it, it looks black when, it, when you get the uh, finish on it. So then I'm going to just turn this. I want to square this edge where it's going to be meet the cuff. So you can use a knife here or you can use a saw, but I've got, I've got it along the edge of a straight edge and I'm using my square to get a nice crisp hold here. It's a low, low guide, but it, it's pretty effective to use your little square like this. Okay. That's that. Now let's go ahead and cut this a little longer than three and a half. Go about an eighth longer. And I want to mark this is my, my saw and clean side. And then you would just keep going like this until you had four per foot. Actually, you could do it this way too. I'll show you with the knife. The scalpel, actually. The number 10A. Mm -hmm. It's for general incisions. Here, we're going to just go up like that. And you could finish if there's any fibers there. That's good. And this is going to be the top of the next one. You just keep going. So I'm going to use this one. So I'll do... We get this on the bench. I'm going to just put a clamp on it here. Just to hold it in position. Because I scored that nicely, I, sh I don't have to worry about prying this up that it's going to go beyond. And that's nice. So you can see that little bit of glue. I just want to scrape that a little bit. Okay, that's pretty good. That won't be a problem. And then we're going to just come right in at that edge, clean that glue right up to that point. So I do that all around and then I would test fit my piece and you can see how nice a joint that is right there. And go ahead right around. Let me just see how quickly these go here. This might go pretty fast. I'm just gonna usually I'll do the opposite sides but if you get them all out of the way, you want to clean them all off all around before you actually start gluing on so you have a nice square crisp line for your cuff to come into. Oh, I can just scrape off any perceived residue there. And again, you can see how nice that line is. So just continue around. Let's see if I, I don't even need to clamp it, I don't think. Well, you can see why clamping is an advantage because <laughs> you end up struggling with it, rolling around on you. Always good to be able to feel confident in the stability. Now, I might have a piece of tape. Yeah, see, this is one where I forgot the tape. So let's lift this up. See, I, it, it's not a problem because the tape protected everything from gluing in and I'm just going to lift the veneer in the same way. It pops up. 
pops right off. There's a little bit of residue there. Get that nice and clean. By the way, um, I saw a little preview of the fine woodworking article that's coming out online, and I thought of it because Garrett Hack, he's a he's a good friend. I I've known him for years through the Furniture Masters group. He's got an article in this issue, and. Um, he explains, he, he does a lot of these cuff feet, and I don't know if he goes into it, but when you see the pieces, you'll see a lot of times I think he used like dark ebony or other types of cuffs, and you'll know exactly how to do it when you see that article. It's a great, this issue actually, I think is really good. Not, not because I'm actually in it. <laughs> I just think the, the, the people who are in this one, like some real old masters, like Curtis Buchanan, who's a really fine Windsor chair maker. He has a beautiful Windsor that he's making in there that it made me, it makes me want to try making one. I haven't made a Windsor, but um, I would love to. It looks so, so nice, like folksy and the, and the craftsmanship is so direct and a lot of nice handwork on it. Just beautiful piece. And then there's, um, uh, Bob Van Dyke is doing one on glues. He's on the cover uh, talking about different kinds of glues. And David Lamb has this table, this round table with four columns. It's a gorgeous table. And that's, that's featured in this issue. And Garrett Hex. And then I have actually it's an extension of the chest of drawers article where they used it for um, for doing the drawers, for making and fitting a drawer. It's, it ended up being like another seven pages, but it's the same drawer in that chest. So it's this very similar pre presentation as I gave to you guys down in Central Florida. If you remember that, we did a, a presentation for the what was the name of that woodworking group? Central Florida Woodworkers Guild. Yeah, the Central Flor Florida Woodworkers Guild. Craig down there and all those guys, we uh, had a nice meeting and talked about making and fitting a drawer to an opening. And um, it was basically that same size drawer. It was, uh, used, I used that chest of drawers for the demo. I'm talking here, but you can see what I'm doing. I'm just kind of laying a thin layer of glue. Remind us what kind of ebony that is, Tom. This is okay. this is Macassar. Macassar. But um, it's very dark Macassar, so it could easily be. I don't want the stripes on this as much. I wanted more of the. Gaboon is harder to find, but you can find a darker Macassar, and it'll be less expensive. So once you get that nicely coated, make sure you're out at the edges again. Then you're going to take your veneer, and I hold it back a little bit so I can push it up and watch the glue kind of squeeze out of the seam. You know you really got some nice glue right in the seam. And then I take a piece of tape, and usually I, I would work on this side, and then I'd get the other side before I put the clamps on so I could clamp and get both at once. So I'm going to get the tape firmly on the veneer and now pull. So I'm pulling the tape, stretching it, which is pulling that joint together. That's going to hold it till I get the clamps on. So I would, I would flip it and do the same there, and then I would put a block on each side. But for now, I'll just do a single block here. So you, you get the idea. It's kind of fun to finish these feet off and see how dramatically different the leg looks without a lot of work and you actually have brought the style up quite a bit to this leg all right so that's what we would do and let me get one that's been in the clamps I did both sides of the foot so there you have the normal method I, I would glue that side and the opposite side same way, I just pulled it right up there. So you can see how nice those jo joints are. And 
now we're overlapped here. And because I did both sides, I can't veneer saw there because this flap is in the way. So you can also, like I said earlier, use the router table. So let's go buzz this off and clean it up and see what it looks like. Okay, I know, I forgot um, the other guy's name who's in this article as well, um, named Hank Gilpin. He, he's, a, he's a really fine maker too, I love his work. And he, he's got an article in there about stretchers and the placement of them and how dramatically different it can make on the aesthetics of a piece. I'm honored actually to be in this one with these, all these characters, you know. But Garrett and David are in the Furniture Masters too, so I think it's the first time there have ever been three members of the New Hampshire Furniture Masters in one issue. All right, so remember, you want to break these corners at a diagonal before you start sanding the faces. And I used a card scraper as well. You might have to, like if your veneers are slightly different thicknesses, sometimes that happens you have to card scrape and sand blend those together. So I have a kind of a question that might be a little bit related to that. Um, Michael's asking, if one uses solid wood for the leg with only veneering the cuff, what is the best technique to remove the wood oh. to accommodate the thickness of the veneered cuff? Oh yeah, Michael, good question. I, uh, so if you have a solid leg, you, what you're gonna do is use the router table. I find that's the easiest way. Put a straight cutting bit in there and you're gonna get a test piece and have a solid piece of wood and you're just gonna run it in. You're gonna raise that, that cutter the thickness of the veneer. So it might be a little experimentation with a sample piece, just run it in and then test the veneer thickness, how, how much depth you've got there. What you wanna do though before you start cutting that is knife around get all your knife marks first and then you can be sure you mark your on your table or somehow that you don't overcut it because it's kind of a blind cut the, the bits on the bottom right so I find that's the easiest way you could do a side cut um, you know and come in from the side and skim it off with a, a side cutter but with it on the the bottom surface I just feel like I have more control that way and then You'll get mark it so that you're, you know that you're coming up close to the shoulder but not stay about an eighth of an inch away. And then you can just pair it to the knife line, almost like we just did. And then you'll, you're just gonna fit it the same way. So you're just cutting that recess down into the solid leg. And then you sand it nicely. And remember to break, you really have to break these corners down here because that veneer is vulnerable to chipping off. And even if it, like here, if I wound into lighter wood, I would probably color it. I'd get, I'd color that, you know, you put a, I mean, you could do it with a Sharpie. So it, Stuart's curious, um, does it plant, does it matter what length you plant on for the veneered foot or is it, um, is there a standard there or was that something you just? It's kind of your personal preference. I've, I, um, I like this length on this nice slender leg. I think it looks nice, um, but it's, that's where you wanna, I don't know what percentage of the height that is, but I like that for this. It's smaller, it just, it, it didn't do it for me. Let's just hold it and get some, some water on so we can kind of see wow. how the contrast actually pops. Gorgeous. So now you can see Let's bring up our table. So there you go. You have a very different appearance, a very contemporary modern looking leg without a lot of effort. And you could do this with any kind of material. 
same leg, same dimension, but now, imagine now you put a, a zebra wood base, put a nice ebony line at the bottom, and then you call it for the top. I don't know, whatever you think. Um, you could do a black base with ebony top, but this is for the ebony, I mean the zebra wood legs with an ebony cuff. I love these kind of explorations into the creative possibilities and I hope you feel inspired to, to go for it in some way and express yourself into your own work. I yeah. love seeing your pictures as well of your pieces and yeah, yeah remember to subscribe if you enjoy this content and head over to epicwoodworking.com if you want to go a little deeper with our content and see lots of portfolio shots and also a lot of classes that are available. Well, thank you so much again for hanging out here. It's been a great night here in the shop. It's been light. We've enjoyed it. And we've made some beautiful things and added beauty to the world.